الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على إمام الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعل منهم آمين. Everyone say آمين. So we praise Allah subhanahu wa taala. We thank Him and praise Him for all the blessings that we have, the blessing of of life, the blessing of the ability to sit here. Uh, in warmth when it's cold and raining outside, but then again, when is it not cold and raining in Wales? Uh, I went to Swansea last year and I spoke to about 100 sheep. No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was cold and raining back then too. So, um, you know, we're here in the warmth and there's people who don't have the choice. You know, sometimes they have to sleep underneath a bridge or they have to find shelter wherever they can. So we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. We thank Allah for uh, eyes that can see and ears that can hear. And... Um, you know, the ability to feel and to love one another, alhamdulillah. And we also ask, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his peace and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For with, without him, we would not have this blessing of iman, of hidayah, which is the most valuable blessing. And the reason why hidayah is the most valuable blessing, I know that it's a common statement that a lot of people say is like, well, guidance is the most valuable thing that we have. And I know that everyone says that, but, I, you know, a lot of my youth that I work with are very honest with me. And they're like, Brother Murphy, I really don't think my, that guidance is, you know, that much more important to me than my PS4, right? So, and they're being honest. So I said, well, you know, the reason why Hidayah is, is, is the most valuable thing that you own is because without it, you wouldn't be able to see life the way that it should be seen, right? It's kind of like how a person might not consider their glasses the most important thing that they own until they lose them. And then they can't see the, worth, the world properly. So the reason why we don't really take Hidayah as seriously as we should is because we're always wearing it. But the minute we lose it, and the minute we're in a state of confusion or flux, that's the minute that we appreciate the guidance that Allah has given us because it, it clarifies the world for us. This tour is called the Be Like Muhammad Tour. I want everyone to say that, Be Like Muhammad. Say it one more time. This is the mission statement of our life. This is the, the goal that we have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ he said that verily, for sure, without a doubt, that a, a messenger was sent to you and he was the most perfect example, the most beautiful example, uswatun hasana. And uswa doesn't just mean example, but it means pattern. Because in order to build an example, in order to build a behavior, you have to do it consistently with routine. And so the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, this verse tells us very, very simply that if we want to know how to act in any situation, whether it's on campus, whether it's at home, whether it's by ourselves or with another person, a friend, if we look at the example of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, we could find the guidance and the direction on how to behave in that situation. And this is the tricky part, is that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, his example is meant to be followed in totality, right, in entirety. And I'm not saying that everybody has to rock this. I don't normally wear this. I'm just doing it because like, I have to, I think. But like, <laughs> I came from Birmingham. I don't know if they let you out unless you wear it, though. Round just barely escaped. But, uh, you know, it doesn't mean necessarily to wear, you know, a thobe because Abu Jahl wore thobes, right? So like Abu Jahl wore the same clothes the Prophet ﷺ did. So this doesn't inherently make someone a good Muslim, right? To have a beard is, again, part of the example, but that alone doesn't make somebody a good Muslim. To wear hijab is also an imperative part of the example, but that alone doesn't make somebody a good Muslim. Being like the Prophet Muhammad is like following a recipe to the T. You guys know what to the T means? I don't know if it's like an American expression or not. All right? The brother was telling me, someone told him before, like, I'll hit you up. And in America, what that means is what? Yo, I'll hit you up later. What does that mean? I'll call you back. And he, he was like, why would you ever hit me? What did I do? <laughs> right? So I, don't, I always have to clarify like, what's an American idiom and what's not. So to follow a recipe to the T. There are some components to recipes. And if you follow me on Instagram, you know that I cook a lot. If you, follow, if you follow a recipe, you know that there are some components to that recipe which are absolutely essential. For example, if you're making chicken thicka, you're going to have some problem if you don't got no chicken. Right? You're just going to make thicka. I don't even know what that means. Right? <laughs> But, but if, it, if you have the chicken and maybe you have some ginger and some garlic and some salt, that's where my brother can cook, right? And you have some of the spices, then you can get close. So there are some components of following the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi which are not negotiable. Just like a, a chicken is not negotiable in a chicken dish. But there are some components, right, which should be 
striven for, you should strive for them, and if you don't attain them, it doesn't ruin the entire experience, but if you're able to attain it, you will enhance your experience. So for example, there was like this one spice. My mom was like, you know, if you're going to make my shawarma, her famous recipe, she's like, you need to get this exact spice. I'm like, well, what if I don't use it? She's like, it'll be terrible, but you can still eat it, right? So it'll still be edible, it'll still do the job of feeding me, but it won't taste exactly the same. So the Prophet Muhammad's example, you can tell that I'm hungry. The Prophet Muhammad's example, when it comes to Islam, is like nailing that recipe. It's like the secret sauce, right? And a lot of people, subhanAllah, we, we claim to be Muslim, we have this, this love and this adherence for our religion, but we kind of sometimes get a little bit frustrated or confused. And I promise you the reason why is because we don't have a good grounding in sirah in the life of the Prophet Muhammad I promise you, if we had a good grounding in two things, in tafsir of the Qur'an and in knowing the life of the Prophet Muhammad I promise you our experience as Muslims would change. Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He wants you to be Muslim, He doesn't want you to be Muslim and hate being Muslim. He wants you to be Muslim and love Islam. Right? The point of religion is not to hate the process. It's not homework. It's not studying for exams. It's supposed to be this life-enhancing experience. Tonight's session is talking about socializing like it's sunnah. And the reason why we came up with this topic name was because of the, the recipe that the Prophet Muhammad presented us to establishing true faith, part of which is to have a social life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Surah Ali Imran, he told him, he said, sorry, let me go. He said, he describes him, and he describes him in a way that's very beautiful. He says that it was by the rahmah, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you would treat people with softness, that you were soft and lenient with people. Because had you been harsh hearted, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then surely they would have run away from you. He's talking about not just, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just talking about the non-believers. He's talking about everybody. He's saying that it's a blessing and it's a mercy from Allah that your character, وَإِنَّكَ عَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Right? وَإِنَّكَ عَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ The Prophet or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him that verily you are on top of good character. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying it's a blessing that you have that good character because if you didn't, if you didn't have that softness of heart, that sweetness of character, if you didn't have what Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu, what he said, I never saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa not smiling. How many of us are not smiling right now? We're all like, all right? Anas said, I never saw him not smiling. He says, that Allah says, if you didn't have that, then your job of teaching people about this faith would have been in vain because they would have run away from you. So you have this faith, you have this recipe, you have this secret code, this treasure chest of valuables, but unless the treasure chest is presented in a way that's nice, that's amicable, no one's going to want to open it. No one's going to want to see what's inside. And so when we look at ourselves as Muslims, especially as Muslim minorities in a majority non-Muslim situation or country, it's especially important for us. Because we, whether or not you want it, represent the Prophet Muhammad We are messengers of the Messenger of Allah You know, one of my teachers when I was younger, he told me that when I was like 13. And I felt so much immense pressure on myself. He says, you are a messenger of the Messenger. Anything that you do, anything that you do, people are going to look back and attribute it to your Messenger. And if you have any ounce of love for him, then you'll ask yourself before you do something, is this going to be okay if someone attributes this to the Prophet Now obviously, no one's going to live up to that example perfectly, but it's the effort that counts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges you based on effort, not based on success. He's nicer than your professors, right? So, he's more merciful than your professors. So when we look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad from an academic perspective, you look at the seerah, what, what's the two things I said we need to increase our understanding of? Number one was? Tafsir. 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 How many of you guys have heard of Sheikh Abdul Nasser, Naman Ali Khan, Imam Sahib Web, they do tafsir out the wazoo. They have tafsir recordings like more than you have time to listen to. And so there's, there's not a, a lack of, of content. There's an abundance of content. So please, please, please get up on that. Then the seerah. If we look at the current seerah, the contemporary seerah resources that we have, you find the majority of them are encyclopedia in nature. For example, they have when the battles happened, when the expeditions happened, what dates this happened, what dates this happened. You find very rarely, for some reason, and in traditional books you find it, but no one translated them, you find very rarely that they talk about the personality of the Prophet Muhammad His character, how he acted with people. 
And to be honest with you, the dates are fine. You can learn those. But to nail down the personality of the Prophet Muhammad is a task that is very rare. One of the best resources I've seen in the English language on this, top, on this topic is Tariq Ramadan's In the Footsteps of the Messenger. Right? I believe it's In the Footsteps of the Prophet of the Messenger. His little Sira book. It's, it's about the size of this Mus'haf. Obviously, it's not as deep in content, but um, it's about that size. It's not too big. It's a wonderful introduction into his character, right? And most of the things that I'm going to talk to you about tonight are going to come from discussions that Dr. Tariq brings up in, these, uh, in, his, in his writings, right? The concept of having a social life might seem superfluous. A lot of people might say to themselves, well, can't I just practice my religion? Why, do I, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanding me to have friends, right? First of all, if you're asking that question, we got to talk, right? <laughs> right? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanding me to have friends? He's not commanding you to have friends. He's saying that it's part of your nature, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly in the Quran, in the Surah, Surah Al-Hujurat, which was recited, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also talks about, you know, inna khalaqnakum. He uses the pronoun kum, all of you, right? Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path. There's always this concept of community, of being part of something of companionship, either at a small or great level. So whether or not you understand or you agree or you appreciate, you're on a team, right? And part of being a good team player is learning how to interact well. If a soccer player, sorry, football player, if a football player takes the ball and doesn't pass to anybody, doesn't, you know, doesn't get open, doesn't sort of give it and go, then how are they ever going to function well on a team? They'll cut that person. They'll be like, look, you're not a team player. Right? And so part of being a part of this ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that we have to acknowledge, appreciate, and work on our skills on being a team player. Many of us are on many different teams. We have many different aspects of teams. For some of us, we have families. That's our first team that we're on. We have a mom and dad who are coaches, right? We have brothers and sisters, maybe siblings. We have cousins. We have people that we're related to. And oftentimes we neglect the people that we're closest to for the people that we're not as close to. So for example, we'll choose our friends over our parents. It's a very ajib kind of like uh, tradition that we find. But you are part of it whether or not you admit it. Then you have your social, you have your ISOC, you have your brothers and sisters, hopefully segregated a little bit, right? And then you have your, you sort of your, your the events like tonight. Then you have the larger community, maybe the larger Muslim community of Cardiff, of Wales, then the United Kingdom, and then obviously the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So whether or not you admit it, you acknowledge it, it's the reality. And so what do you call someone who does not acknowledge reality? That person is in denial. None of us want to be in denial. So we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to open our eyes and hearts and to make us people who want to encourage our relationships with other people. Let's talk about some characteristics of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I have some stories to tell you. We're going to go through these stories, inshaAllah, and then we'll be finished with the talk. It's not too long, and I apologize for being late. Uh, I really appreciate your patience. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the first characteristic, and if you have a notebook, you should write this down. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the first characteristic that he had is one that's not, um, not directly stated, but you can kind of extrapolate from all of the hadith literature that we have, right? And that is... The Prophet ﷺ enjoyed being with people and he ﷺ was open to being with people. He wasn't someone who was cut off. Okay? He wasn't someone who was cut off. And you find, by the way, a lot now in pop culture and current modern sort of like culture that it's cool to be a loner. Alright? How many of you all saw Twilight? Don't lie. We all saw Twilight. I was forced. Right? No. So, no, Twilight's a great comedy, actually. It's a wonderful comedy. If you really want to laugh, you should just watch it. But if you look at the main character, the main characters, they all are sort of like these insular people who don't like talking to people. And then immediately after Twilight came out, you go on Twitter and I see all the girls from our youth group, they're like, I don't like people. <laughs> Leave me alone, right? That's not the character of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was the kind of guy that, how do you think we got all the hadith that are narrated to us? A lot of which are from his wife, Aisha radiallahu anha, who was the second most after who? Who was the first? Abu Huraira, very good, Abu Huraira. Who was the first after Abu Huraira? But how do you think Abu Huraira was able to yield these narrations? Because the Prophet ﷺ was someone who was like, Hey, Abu Huraira, come on over, right? Come hang out. Abu Huraira would be at the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ lived right next door. Any time that was available to the Prophet's time, obviously he had a schedule, any time that was open, people could come up to his door, could knock on it, and he would see them. You know, there's a famous narration of uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where uh, Abu Bakr, a Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he knocks on the door, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, come in. Abu Bakr walks in and he sees the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just chilling, just lying down on his side. So much so that they said that his knee was showing. Like his, his, the, the, the cloth he was wearing around his waist, it, his knee was showing. Meaning what? He was relaxed, he was comfortable. 
when someone walks in and you're not relaxed and comfortable, what do you do? You like straighten up your clothes. You're like, right? You try to like get all like at attention for them. The prophet was chilling, man. Like he was kicking it, right? And then who comes next? Amr ibn Khattab comes and knocks. He walks in and then still chilling. The prophet like, yeah, come in, come in. Let's hang out, right? Just hanging out. And then Uthman walks in. And this is where the narration changes a little bit. Uthman knocks, walks in, and the Prophet sees him and he fixes his, he fixes his clothing. And Abu Bakr and Omar are like, what? <laughs> okay, what are you trying to say? Like, why not us? And he said, Should it, he said, shouldn't I be shy a little bit of the one who the angels are even shy of? Meaning Uthman was someone who his character was so full of modesty that even the angels were like, kind of like shy around Uthman. So the Prophet was like, I can't be laying down in front of Uthman. Uthman's like... You know, you have those friends that you can lay down in front of, and you have the friends that you cannot lay down in front of, right? <laughs> so Uthman, and not, out of, not, not something that was wrong with them, but something that, like, you just, out of respect almost for their aura, right? You just respect them, so you just don't do that, right? And so Uthman was one of those people. So the Prophet ﷺ was very open to being with people. As I narrate these characteristics, remember, we talked about the Prophet ﷺ was a example. Uswatun Hasana. So look at yourself, ask yourself, am I somebody who pushes people away? The Prophet ﷺ was someone who was magnetic. If there's one description I'm going to give to him, he was an attractor. He was someone that people would want to spend time with. That app, how about this? As they were ending their conversation, the, pre- the person would not want it to end. Ask yourself, am I that person? Right? And if I'm not, what can I do to fix that? And remember we talked about first is with our families immediately. The families have to be first. We can't neglect our families while we're serving our other social circles, our other teams. We've got to make sure that we have our families down first. And this is especially important for young people. Are your parents the kind of people that want to talk to you? Parents, are you the kind of people that your kids want to talk to? Right? This is a very, very important building block in the home. Are you someone who is magnetic, who is attractive to people for conversation? Okay? That was the first Characteristic of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we can talk about. He was socially attractive. People always wanted to see him. Number two, he would always be positive. He would always be positive. Like I said in the hadith before about Anas radiallahu anhu, he said, I never saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not smiling. Guys, do you think the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had times where he didn't smile? Let's be real. Can we be real for a second? Yes or no? Yeah, we know for sure. Like, for example, there's times, I don't think, I don't think the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was smiling in battle. I don't think he smiled when his son passed away, his children passed away. I don't think he smiled when his uncle or wife passed away. We know for a fact there were times when he did not smile. This does not discount the narration of Ennis. Actually, it makes it stronger. Why? Let me tell you, let me tell you guys something or ask you a question. When someone is known for something, right? When someone is absolutely like you know that's part of their character, we oftentimes, as a medium of balagha, of rhetoric, we attribute it to them all the time, right? So for example, if someone works out a lot, what do you say about them? They're always at the gym, right? Are they literally always at the gym? I hope not. <laughs> Brother's got to go to the bathroom. He's got to sleep, like, you know what I'm saying? But we say what? Man, that guy is always at the gym, right? And you say, like, my mom cooks so much, she never leaves the... Right? I'm not assigning gender roles. Mothers don't have to cook. Brother can cook. But I'm just saying... So even in the English language, you see how we assign perpetuity. We make things perpetual when they're not necessarily infinite, but rather they're, com- they're common or constant. So Enes, when he described the Prophet ﷺ as this, it doesn't literally mean that the Prophet ﷺ never smiled. We know there were times where he didn't smile. But what it means was he smiled so much that I could describe him as always smiling because I never saw him not smile. Right? It's a phenomenal thing. Ask yourself. Now, check yourself. Look in the mirror. Am I a person who's positive when people encounter me, right? And check, check out one, one more thing. Am I positive even when things in my life are not going so well? This is something the Prophet Sallallahu had down. He mastered this. He didn't hide or mask things. Rather, he didn't pass off or project his stresses to other people. This was something that he, he was a master of this. And we have this characteristic, unfortunately, is that when things bother us, then in order to get it off of our chest and sort of express it and sort of spread the wealth, even though it's not wealth, it's more like dirt, but like when we're upset, when things bother us, we give it to other people, right? We become like this ball of negative energy. We just want to spread it out. The Prophet ﷺ, when things were stressing him out, when things were bothering him, he would hold it in. He would tell who was appropriate. But generally, if people came to him, he would be positive. And you see this in all kinds of situations. One time, a young man went to the Prophet ﷺ and asked, Ya Rasulullah, I want you to give me a fatwa for zina, right? 
Like, first of all, just imagine that for a second. Like, that conversation. Hashtag awkward. Like, you're just like, <laughs> okay. And the companions were around the prophet system, and they're just like, is this dude trolling? Like, what is going on? And he was serious. He's like, yeah, school law. I'm attracted to this girl. Can I get a fatwa, right? I mean, if, I mean, I don't know what I would say if a young person came up to me. First of all, I don't even know. SubhanAllah, look at the comfort level that they had with him, that they were like, Ya Rasulullah, can you give me a fatwa to do this clearly haram act? Like they were so comfortable with him. He never, that goes back to the first point, he never repelled people. They were so comfortable even to the point where they would go ask him for such a thing. Ajib, right? That's why we say Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Because like, look at that character. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so he looks at the young man and he says, let me ask you a question. He never, by the way, in this whole conversation, listen for a no. He never says no. He says, let me ask you a question. He says, do you have any women folk in your family? Any mothers, sisters, you know, daughters, cousins, etc. He goes, yeah, yeah. Obviously, I'm born to a mother. Everybody was. And he goes, you know, I have a sister. I have women folk. And he goes, how would you feel if somebody came to you or me and asked me for permission to do this act with your women in your family, the people that you hold dear to your heart? And the guy said, I would hate it. And he said, so how do you think the, the, the family of this girl feels if they, or if they were to find out, how would they feel if they knew that you were asking for this? And the, and the young man said, wow, I never thought about it that way. In the narration, then he says he walked away. He said, when I was walking to the Prophet Muhammad there was nothing more dear to my heart than zina, right? Typical teenage, right? And he goes, when I was leaving the Prophet Muhammad there was nothing more hated to my heart than that act. Because the Prophet ﷺ put his hand on the chest of the young man. He said, oh Allah, purify his heart. Oh Allah, purify his heart. Oh Allah, purify his heart. Always got positive energy coming out of him. That situation could have demanded a smack, right? That situation could have demanded like, get out of here, what are you talking about? But the Prophet ﷺ exuded this positive energy. Y'all know about the situation where the Bedouin man came in and peed in the Prophet's masjid? So imagine we're just in this room right now and some dude walks in and starts peeing in the corner, right? First of all, what would the reaction be? It would be very similar to what the Sahaba did. The Sahaba were like, excuse me, right? They were like, man. They were like, first of all, that's not, and they were like about getting ready to tackle the dude, right? And so the Prophet says, wait, let him finish. Now this is an ultimate negative situation. Someone is literally relieving themselves in the masjid. I don't know any silver lining you can find from this situation. The Prophet says, let him finish. Then when the man's done, he tells the, the same companions who were mad, go get some things to clean it up. He doesn't even tell the guy to clean it up. Then he goes to the man and he says, this is the masjid, this is a place of worship. We don't do these, it's not like them. We don't do these things here. Please withhold from doing these things here. There's another story, where a similar situation, where a man comes to the Prophet Muhammad and he says, Ya Rasulullah, he says, I need money. And he asks in front of everybody, I need money. And the Prophet's like, okay, that's fine, we'll take care of it. All the Sahaba are like so upset. You don't talk to the Prophet like that. Right? So they're about to like wrestle with the dude. And the Prophet says, hold up, hold up. So he calls the guy inside. He takes him inside. And he says, how much money do you need? And he gives him, you know, a certain amount of money. And the man leaves. The man walks out with the Prophet. He says, I need this much money. He gives it to him. He walks out. And then the, he walks away. He leaves. And the companions say, Ya Rasulullah, why didn't you let us like take care of him? He was being really disrespectful to you. And the Prophet ﷺ said he was like a scared animal. And if you guys had jumped on him, you would have scared him away forever from the religion. So I, like a smart person who knows how to deal with scared animals, I took him inside and I handled the situation. Right? There were times where people, after being treated roughly, when the Prophet ﷺ treated them positively, they would make du'a, Oh Allah, be happy with me and Muhammad and nobody else. Right? So they would make du'a against all the companions like in, a, in a little subversive way. Because why? Because the companions were like rolling up their sleeves about to do some business, right? So it's important to understand, to exude that positive energy that the Prophet ﷺ had. Check yourself, look in the mirror. Am I positive? Am I a positive person? Am I always spewing negativity? I'll be real with you, and we're going to have to edit this out because the people in my community, but there is a couple people that I know that I work with who are always negative. And there's times where you and I are negative too. You can't help it, right? But I'm talking about always negative. Like, they could find, you know how there's people who could always find the good in a the situation? They find the bad in every situation. Like there's a box of Krispy Kreme donuts and they're like, I want Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> and you're like, it's free. He's like, I like paying for my donuts. <laughs> and you're just like, what? Then it's like, you know, like for example, today, Today, there's a, uh, it's snowing a lot in Knoxville, so all the schools let out early because like, the roads are going to get crazy. So they let the kids out early. 
And one of the, it's a snow day, right? Would you guys be pumped for a snow day? No classes, you get to sleep, Netflix all day, what? Right? You get to sleep all day. You get to watch reruns of Sherlock and Downton Abbey all day. So, sorry, that's just me. Uh, so they let out. It's everyone celebrating. Everybody, well, I, like on Twitter, it's like, a, it's like someone won the election. Like everyone's celebrating. These same people who are negative, I kid you not, well, they go, oh, I studied for an exam all night last night. <laughs> and now we're not even taking it. What are you talking about? Just be positive for once. Like this person could win the lottery and they would be like, I don't want that much. <laughs> right? I don't, I don't understand. Even though it's hot on, obviously. But I don't, I don't understand. It takes a special skill to be negative all the time. And so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had the opposite master where he was just perpetually positive, alayhi salam. The third thing, now this is really important, especially for socializing and being close to people, is that he would always give people honor. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ كَرِيمُ قَوْمٍ فَأَكْرِمُهُ If someone comes to you who is noble from their, from their people, then honor them, then give them that honor and nobility. What's beautiful about this hadith, and Shawali Allah Dahlawi, rahimahullah, he comments on this. He says that every person is noble to some group of people. So for example, a person might not be noble to like the entire country, but they're noble to their wife. And so you shouldn't dishonor somebody in front of their family or in front of their spouse or their husband or their kids or their parents. Right? Everybody is honorable to somebody. So this hadith is beautiful because there's tawassa al ma'ani, right? There's like this wideness and meaning that you, you, unless you think about it deeply, you wouldn't come up with that. Because whenever, when I first quoted the hadith, we probably all thought of like dignitaries and government positions and etc. And it applies for that too. But it's also don't restrict the meaning of the hadith. The hadith is talking about anybody who has any honor. You know, Salman al-Farisi, rahimahullah, <coughs> or radiallahu an, and rahimahullah. Salman al-Farisi, he had the most beautiful story of conversion. And because of time, we can't tell the whole thing today. But Sheikh Abdel Nasser has a really good podcast on it. If you can listen to it on the Qalam recordings, it's very good. But Salman al-Farisi, basically, he's the most mukhlis, he's the most sincere search of the religion that I think I've ever read in the Sirah. Where he basically was like really far away, right? He's from Persia. And he searched and went through like three different religions to find the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And he did so on like um, these little tidbits of information. He never got a message from the Prophet, he never met the Prophet, he never heard from him. He just did so based on people, what they said. And he ended, he ended up finding the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? So there was one time where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where they were starting to build the masjid. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he would do, was in order to encourage like camaraderie and like teamwork, he would make teams. And based, you know, at that time you had the Muhajirun and the Ansar, you had the people who came from Mecca and those who lived in Medina. The Prophet ﷺ wasn't trying to make a competition of like hatred, rather he was like, look, I know that these people, they know each other, they work well together, and the same for the Ansar, so these are going to be the two teams. Okay? What is the place of Salman of Fadisi? Because he got to Medina before the Prophet ﷺ got there, right? But he's not from Mecca. He got to Medina before the Prophet got there, but he's not from Mecca. So which team does he fall on? Anyone have any ideas? No? Nothing? Okay, so what's interesting is that when you, when you guys are playing sports, right, or your sister are playing sports, and you're like picking teams, the last person usually feels terrible, right? Because they're like the last person. And then it's like, you know, it's even teams, so you're like playing six on six or seven on seven, and it's like seven on six, and there's that last person, and you're like, ah, oh, I think our team's good with six, we'll be fine. <laughs> like, yeah, just can you keep score? Okay, uh, we might need water or like a towel, you know. And the person feels terrible, because like everyone's trying to avoid, literally everyone's trying to avoid picking that person. That's why he or she is last. So Salman the Pharisee, he kind of had this initial feeling at first. But subhanAllah, look at the character, look at the way the Prophet taught these people how he trained them. The people from Mecca, the Sahaba, and the people from Ansar, the Sahaba, they weren't fighting over who would have to take him, they were fighting over who would get him. So instead of saying, no, 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 we're fine, we're good, we're good, you guys take Salman. They were like, no, Salman's ours, we want Salman. And the other team was like, no, 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 we want Salman. So instead of making the person feel unwanted, they made him feel immensely wanted. But the Prophet ﷺ outdid them, right? So we're talking about what? He honored and respected people. And Salman, by the way, was a slave. He worked as a slave. And so this is someone who inherently, in their socio-political system, did not have honor. The Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, what did he do? He said, no, 
Salman, you are from my house. Ahl Bayti, you're from my family. Right? So he said, you're not from them or them, you're with me. Look, I mean, like, how many of us would love that situation where the Prophet ﷺ says, you're with me, you're from my family. Look at Bilal, an, the person who was literally a slave, was tortured. Who did the Prophet, what position did the Prophet ﷺ give him in society? The Mu'adhin, the person to call Adhan. That's the, that's the next in line after the Imam. Then you have another man, Abdullah bin Umm Maktoum. We're going to talk about them later in the week. Abdullah bin Umm Maktoum, you guys know who he is? He's a blind old man. Do you guys know the Surah Abbas wa Tawalla? You guys know the story, the, the story behind it? Where the man comes to the Prophet, the Prophet's talking to Quraysh, and then he says, Ya Rasul, and he's asking him like some small fiqh mas'ala, and, and the Prophet's like obviously having a very serious conversation with like the leaders of Quraysh, and then he turns, he, the Prophet says some kind of like frowns and turns away. That's Abdullah bin Umm Maktoum who he's doing that to. This is a blind man. The Prophet ﷺ made Abdullah bin Umm Maktoum as well, the Mu'adhin, and whenever they went on the Ghazwa, on the Maghazi, whenever they went on the expeditions, Abdullah bin Umm Maktoum would be the leader of Medina. He'd be like the interim president. Little trivia for you. In order to be Mu'adhin, what's the essential function that you have to have? Huh? What's the second? <laughs> That's good, you're right, you're right. <laughs> You, you beat me, okay. What's the second most essential function that you have to have? So a voice, but how do you recognize when it's time to pray? Huh? The sun. What do you need in order to recognize where the sun is? Your eyes. So the Prophet ﷺ made a blind man a mu'adhin, even though part and parcel of that job is to have eyesight, because you need to see the location of the sun so then you can call the prayer. So the Prophet ﷺ was making a statement. He says, I don't care what you guys think of this blind man, whether you think he's useless or worthless or whatever. I'm going to give him this position, even though he's really not fit for it, we'll make a way for him. We'll make a way. You, you notice where the sun is? Tell him what it is so he can call the prayer. Right? He honored people, even when they themselves were not honored by their own people. Ask yourself, do I honor people? When I see people, do I give them that honor? You know, there's a group um, in, in America called Hillel. Do you guys know what they are? Hillel? Hillel? It's the Jewish group. So it's like the Jewish group. They're, they tend to be not Zionist, but some of them are. And so it's very interesting. But they're basically like the ISOC of the, of the Jewish community. And so the one that we have, everyone's laughing for some reason, the one that we have in our university in Tennessee is not, she's not Zionist. In fact, I don't even know if she's Jewish, really, to be honest with you, right? And she is like a really nice person. She's very nice. Like she's very anti-Zionist. She's like, we should not even be there. According to our scriptures, we're not supposed to have a country. So it's kind of weird. You know, she's very anti-Zionist. She's very pro-Palestinian cause. And subhanAllah, you know, she has a big following. She has a big following because she's the leader of this massive student organization. And they have a ton of funding and, you know, got that and everything. She comes in once and, and the people don't, the, the Muslims sometimes don't understand the difference between a Zionist and a Jew. And so they start, you know, like snickering at her and making comments. And what has that done? That set our relationship with Hillel back like, you know, like months. Because people are like, oh yeah, she's a Jew, oh yeah, this, and then drop a penny, ha ha, like all these jokes, right? <laughs> and she's like, and she hears it and she's like, and you know what I thought about? I thought, man, what if, your, what if your brother Murphy went to their organization and they were like, oh, careful, he's got a bomb strapped on him, like, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm I six or whatever, whoever's listening. <laughs> Point being is that when you dishonor somebody to their people, then you lose honor as well. And so the Prophet ﷺ teaches us this is very, very important. Do you honor people? Number four, he used to joke around. We're going to speed through the rest of these. He used to joke around a lot, okay? And I know a lot of you, some of you probably aren't funny, but that's okay, right? <laughs> we can work on it. We can work on it, all right? At least you can laugh, inshallah. So he used to joke around. The Prophet ﷺ one time was sitting with the Sahaba again. Point number one, he was sitting with the Sahaba. So we're going to talk about how he used all these points. He was sitting with the people, right? Point number one was what? He used to see people a lot. He was sitting with the Sahaba, and they were eating dates. They were snacking on some dates, right? And he was talking to another companion to his right, and Omar an, was sitting on his left. And as they all finished their dates, they had a little pile of, of uh, date pits in front of them. So what Omar did, radiallahu anhu, was he took his pile of date pits and he put it in front of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When the Prophet wasn't looking, like he was looking at somebody else. But the Prophet is not dumb, man. He's smart. I mean, he's the Prophet. So he was like, <laughs> so he sees the date pits, and I think he, you know, he saw the he saw Omar, and he probably figured out what was going on. So Omar, in front of everybody, trying to be a jokester, he's like, Ya Rasulullah, you must have been really hungry, man. Like you had all those dates. Dang, you must have been hungry, right? You should have told me. I could have got you some food. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, No, Omar, you must have been even more hungry because you ate your seeds too. Because <laughs> he sees no seeds in front of him. So he used to joke around. Like he was very funny. He was very humorous. One time there was a, you know, there was, um, 
there was, you know, his, his grandchildren, Hassan and Hussein, radiallahu anhuma, and they were riding on his back. This is the Prophet saw them. You either saw him delivering the message, giving people, teaching people, or playing with his family, right? So he, he was literally on his hands and knees, and they were, and he was, uh, you know, he had Al Hassan Hussein on his back. It was grandchildren, and Subhanallah, uh, they <laughs> people would walk by him, and he wouldn't be afraid. He wouldn't be embarrassed. Right? Imagine your imam or your sheikh or like your favorite speaker and seeing them like in the hallway over here with their kids in the back and like crawling around like Rawr! like making noises and you walk by they're like oh get up get up get up like it's not like yeah the class is this way inshallah right he wasn't like that the prophet didn't get up he was like yeah I'm playing with my grandkids what do you want I'm a grandpa like what that's my job that's what I'm supposed to do so he's playing with them on his back and besides being able to tell a joke what's what do a lot of people lack a lot of people are funny but what happens they're not able to take jokes. Right? So they can make jokes at people's expenses, but they're, I mean, the Prophet didn't make it at anyone's expense, technically, but there's a little bit of a, kind of like a little poke, but they're not able to take it back. Right? They're like Pillsbury Doughboy. Like you poke them, like, hoo hoo, like they get really. So the Prophet, someone walks by him, I believe it was, uh, I believe it was Ahmad actually, I believe it was Ahmad, radiallahu an, and he walks by him and he says, Ya Rasulullah, he says, man, they, uh, they have a good horse. Right, so he's talking about the Prophet. He's saying, man, these, your, your grandkids, they have a very nice horse. Right? And the Prophet responds back and says, yeah, but they're even better riders. And he says, and so is their dad, Ali. Right? So it's just I mean, this beautiful, beautiful relationship of being humorous, of joking, of not taking jokes seriously. And subhanAllah, this is very interesting. There's a, there's a caveat, there's a condition, there's a protocol that they told the Prophet Muhammad and they said, Ya Rasulullah, you joke with us too. And he says, yes, but I always tell the truth. And I never hurt anyone's feelings when I do it. Right? Now I asked my teacher, I asked him, I said, so what happens, like a lot of our jokes are pure exaggeration. Like a lot of the, our Western postmodern kind of humor is just pure exaggeration. My teacher clarified, he said, as long as everybody knows that it's not serious, that it's, that it's an exaggeration. So for example, if I said it took me seven hours to drive here, or it took me 15 hours or two days to drive here, something so wild that you're like, there's no way he's telling the truth, that's clearly an exaggeration. My teacher said, that's okay. But if you're lying to somebody in order to make things funnier, or in order to deceive them into feeling some way, or to scare them, right, which is unfortunately we do that a lot, right, like hiding behind doors and stuff, in order to scare them, maybe not you, maybe just me, okay, uh, watch your way out, you might see me behind a door. Then my teacher said you shouldn't do that because that's lying during joking. But if it's a joke where you're like, oh my God, I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse. I'm like, really? You can eat a horse? Oh my gosh, bro. Even though horse meat's apparently common in the UK, but. <laughs> but everyone knows that I'm, I'm not being serious, then that, that kind of joking is okay. But the Prophet ﷺ would never make a joke at the expense of someone's feelings, right? Never ever would he made it, make a joke. There was one time there was a a companion by the name of Nazir, Nazir, he was sitting in the marketplace, the Prophet ﷺ came up behind him, and he covered his eyes, right? And Nazir was like, he was kind of shocked, he's like, who is this? And the Prophet ﷺ announced in a loud voice in the marketplace, who wants to buy my slave? And that's a very serious, by the way, that's a very serious thing, like to say that in a marketplace is a very serious, who wants to buy my servant, my slave, right? And then he uncovers his eyes, and he looks up and sees the Prophet ﷺ, so his fear turns into like, just relief, and he knows the Prophet was joking, and he starts smiling, and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I'm so worthless, no one would ever want to buy me. Right? So you could tell maybe he was feeling down, he was feeling kind of sad. The Prophet ﷺ took that negative momentum and turned it into positive. What did he say? He said, in the eyes of Allah, you are worth so much more than what these people see. Right? He gave him this sort of like, this sakina in his heart. He said, don't worry about what people might think of you, who cares? They're just people, it's just dunya. What Allah thinks of you is so much more important. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet Muhammad was able to joke around. And the, the last thing I'll say <clears throat> is that he wouldn't get upset over petty matters. He wouldn't get upset over small things. There was a companion by the name of Nurman who the, he, he tasted some honey in the marketplace. And he had, he, he had this delicious honey. And he said, man, I really want the Prophet Sallallahu to try this honey because the Prophet used to love honey. Right? You guys know the funny story about one time his wives tried to play a joke on him and they said that this honey made your breath smell. And he loved honey, so he was like heartbroken because he loved honey and they're like, it makes your breath stink, right? Because one of the other wives gave it to him. Anyway, okay, so they were playing a joke on him. Anyway, so he loved honey and he was known to have loved honey. So man, he said, Ya Rasulullah, he, he said, I have some honey for you. But what the Prophet Sallallahu didn't know is that man brought a, a sampling of the honey but didn't pay for it. Okay, so he's like, I have some honey for you. So the Prophet was like, wow, what a gift, that's so nice. So he eats it and he loves it. And as he finishes it, Nurman's like, okay, that's going to be this much money. 
And the prophet starts laughing and he says, you didn't pay for it? <laughs> he says, you gave me a gift and I ate it, you didn't pay for it? And the man, he turned to the prophet and he said, I'm so poor, Ya Rasulullah, that I couldn't afford it, but my love for you was so much that I wanted to give you this gift because I knew you'd love it. And it's funny, but look at how sweet that is. I'm broke, okay? I'm as broke as a joke. But I love you so much as a friend that I, I wanted to give you this gift because I just knew that you would love it. And you loved it. So let's pay for it, right? <laughs> so it's kind of like that. But, but, okay, now let's backtrack a little bit, okay? If that happened to you and I, we'd be like, man, why would you give me something if I have to pay for it now? I could have gotten it myself, right? I could have ordered it. I could have gone there. But look at how the Prophet took the, the intention, the niya, the positive intention, and he didn't get upset over the small thing. What's it going to cost in the end of the day? The equivalent of like one pound, two pound, three pound, five pound, whatever, or quid. Can I say quid? That's cool. Ten quid, right? What's it going to cost? In the grand scheme of things, yeah, it might be that, it might be your, cof- your coffee budget for that day or your lunch meal budget for that day, but he didn't get upset over petty things. You know, one of the biggest things that happens, brothers and sisters, in our social groups is friendships are tested and sometimes even broken over the smallest things that then snowball to something bigger and then like it's, it's ir- irreparable at that point, right? So it started off as like, well, he untied my shoes. No one unties my shoes, right? <laughs> Not even my mom can untie my shoes. It's like, that, he untied your shoes. Like, yeah, but then he didn't say sorry. No one doesn't say sorry to me. And it's like, what? And then he's like, yeah. And then he didn't hold the door open for me. So it's like you're this cumulative snowball when in fact had we just squashed the issue in the beginning, that petty issue, we wouldn't have had these things, right? And, and sometimes it, it all starts off as a small joke because it gets very serious very fast. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to become socially positive and to become people whose Islam is magnified through their social ability, not uh, tainted. Because oftentimes, and this is too true, um, religion is harmed and the view of religion is harmed by people who claim themselves to be religious. And so you find that people are oftentimes turned away from Islam by those who claim to be great Muslims. And, And part of the reason why is because they haven't worked on their social character enough to be somebody who's magnetic like the Prophet Sallallahu and who has a good vibe, good positive vibe and a good sense of humor. So this is very important. As much as it is for you guys to seek knowledge, as much as it is for you guys to, to have an Islamic identity, to be proud of your fact that you're being Muslim, don't ever discount the ability to be socially normative with people and to be somebody who is, you know, very kind of like approachable. You guys know Sheikh Yahya Rodas? Anybody? So he's in Cambridge. He's, he's a famous uh, scholar from America. He's a student of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and some other big scholars. He's in Cambridge right now. I met with him last night. And he wears, um, he studied in Yemen. He wears this thing called the Rida, right? And so or it's kind of like a lungi. You guys know what a lungi is? <laughs> okay, so he wears a lungi. For Arabs, it's called an uh, Arzad, I think. You got, we call it an Arzad, like the, the, it's like a thing, right? I don't know what else to describe it. <laughs> it's a piece of cloth that's tied together at the end. So he wears that, right? And he was in my, my home city of Knoxville, or my, the town that I live in of Knoxville, Tennessee. And what he did, subhanAllah, was he went into a subway. And this is like in the middle of like Bufu country America, right? Like America, right? And he goes in and he's wearing this outfit that's very clearly not American, right? And this is in the middle of people who watch like Fox News as like their main source of like Hidayah, right? And so you can imagine that this lady, her perception of him is like, Oh my God, this terrorist wants to tune a sub. Like, what am I going to do, right? So he walks in, and subhanAllah, just through his interaction with her, because he was born in Kansas City, very American heritage, his, his grandparents born in Kentucky, his interaction with her led her to say what to him? She said, well, I, you know, I may not believe in Islam, but y'all are welcome here, right? And that's a big deal. I'm telling you, that's a big deal in America. For someone to say, you're welcome here, in the middle of a country hick town, like it's very, a, bit, it's a huge deal. Why? It wasn't because of his, you know, he didn't drop like mutun on her and like fik mas'a'il. He's like, oh, check this out. Bam, bam, bam. Like tafsir, akida this. He just treated her nicely. His socializing was up to, up to par. And he was able to really show her that through his character. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the prophetic character, the ability to keep our relationships pure and happy with each other, and the ability to socialize the way the Prophet ﷺ did. Amin, Rabbil Alameen. Subhanakallah, Mubihamdik, Nashadu, Wa La Ilaha Illa Ant, Nastaghfiru Kutub